Hi, this is Saran Fox and Dan Watanabe and we're Dan and Saran take on Hollywood. Today our guest is Michael Gonzalez. Hello. How's it going? And we're going to be talking about an article that appeared in The Guardian and it was talking all about some of the things that are happening in Hollywood right now and how Hollywood is in desperate need of a new renaissance. Similar to the renaissance that happened I know this is going to sound like it's uh -oh. paleo film how, history. How long ago? 50 years ago okay. mm -hmm. when Bonnie and Clyde came out and completely revolutionized what the motion picture business was for the better. And the motion picture business at that time was in a similar situation to where we are today where you had nothing but really, really expensive pictures being made. You had a, a societal change in the form of the production code having ended just two years earlier. And everyone was struggling to figure out how to make money. And the answer for the studios at that time, uh, or at least the main line of the studios, was to do increasingly big right. budget movies. Like and, Darling Lily and Star. And Hello, Dolly and yeah. Dr. Doolittle. Right. All from 20th Century Fox, which pretty much was, was on a downward spiral. Absolutely. Uh, Warner Brothers had experienced a somewhat uh, disastrous uh, reception to My Fair Lady. Mm-hmm. And so everybody was in trouble. There was a plethora of kind of bland films. There was, I'm thinking about the Doris Day movie, Midnight Lace. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about Charade and all those other one name things with Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant. There was also, they, as noted in the article, they didn't address uh, social issues, drug use, Vietnam. Well, uh, so we were only two years out at that point, again, from Sound of Music and the end of the production code. Right. So it was a very transitional period. Absolutely. And, and Hollywood didn't quite know how to deal with it. But there was another influence that had come into town, and that was the rise of the film school culture and mm -hmm. the rise of film being looked at as an artistic means. And what that had resulted in was what were called auteurist studies. Right. And, and this whole idea that you would have a single creator behind the, uh, a successful movie. And that successful creator was credited with being the director. And if you want to read about this, there's a book called Raging Bulls, and I forgot the second part of the of the title, but it talks about Coppola, Easy Riders, and Scors Easy Riders Scorsese, and Coppola, and all the others who came from film schools, who brought a kind of wild west yet disciplined mentality and a willingness to to take chances. The difference that's going on today is, is the rise of all the platforms, mm -hmm. and the strength of independent films and studio financed films like Fox Searchlight, where they're making films with smaller stories, interesting character development, and we have today also what's going on is the franchises are failing for the most part. I mean. Well, that, that's where the, the tie-in with the late 60s was, where, mm. where you had The Sound of Music being such a hit. I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible for us today in the world of multiple windows to right. understand that the sound of, what a phenomenon The Sound of Music was. Did you know that it played theatrically until 1971? Yes, yes. In its first run. So imagine a movie playing for six years, and if you were in some podunk small town that mm. had two theaters, you had one theater. You the had, well, was you had one, one theater, and you also had three or four TV channels. Yeah. That was it. That was it. So your world was much smaller. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I think that uh, it's a very, you know, comparing the two, it's, it's, it's a little, you know, a little dangerous to compare. I, I, I think it was a great article, comparing the two, because it was such a different time, and it's such a different time now. The, the only thing, not the, one of the things that is the c common thread in both of them is Hollywood is in trouble. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hollywood has so much competition today, first of all, from what I love to champion, which is great TV, which is because I watch a lot of it. I'm going out of town next week for like six days, and I made a list of all the shows that I watch that I have to either DVR or, or, or go on to um, VOD to watch, and I'm almost embarrassed to say how many of them there, there are, and they're mostly all quality. So you have competition from great TV and Netflix and streaming, all the other mm -hmm. streaming services, independent film and the internet. Mm -hmm. 
So to bring people mm -hmm. into movie theaters for 15, 20 bucks a pop, there has to be something like Wonder, Wonder Woman. Correct. That, which did, actually did pretty well as far mm -hmm. as, uh, especially for uh, the DC. Um, but the, the movies that I point to in terms of like making an impact yeah. and actually where I see the potential for, maybe not necessarily, well, I would say, yeah, the potential for a renaissance mm -hmm. would be films like Don't Breathe and um, The Big One, Get Out. Mm -hmm. which, Absolutely. Which, Absolutely. which if you, if you just, just, if you base it on their box office, uh, Don't Breathe had a $9 million budget and mm -hmm. made $150 million, mm -hmm. and then, and that's uh, right now, as of, as of right now, or as of today, and then with uh, Get Out, that's two hundred fifty million on a four on a four million dollar budget. And I saw Get, Get Out like six weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. was very impressed, very impressed <clears throat> with its originality. Yeah. And yet, it was based on a, a highly unoriginal genre. Yep. And yep. I was also no. There's Jordan <coughs> Peele, who was part of Keem Peele. Mm -hmm. He was a, a com comedian, comic actor, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And he had this idea, and he wrote this script. And someone took a chance and gave him the directing yep. shot. So writing and directing. Writing and directing. Mm -hmm. He did both. And th he was able to get the money and the actors. Mm -hmm. And and he's he's part of Keen Peel. Mm -hmm. I mean, not he, they don't have that big an audience, but he was able to do this. So I think there are more opportunities these days. Yep. What I did, well, I, I just also want to address something that was addressed in the article, which was a few months later, the release of The Graduate. Yes. Where the studio wanted uh, Robert Redford. And five years later, they four years later, they also wanted him to play Michael Corleone. Mm -hmm. So when you look at Dustin Hoffman, and then you and then you, I was just talking about this recently that when you look at Bonnie and Clyde, who look like ordinary people, then you had these two absolutely beautiful movie stars playing them, and then you had The Graduate, and the lead is this Nebuchadnezzar Jewish guy, and. The, just, just the when you think about that, well, just the contrast. It, 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 that was furthered with Barbara Streisand. Yes. Because because the studios knew that she was a talent because she had appeared on on the Judy Garland show. She'd been in nightclubs and everyone knew that she was going to be a sensation. But even with Funny Girl, there was a little bit, not a lot, but there was a little bit of consternation about casting her in it because she was an unknown and this was a huge picture. And they wanted her to get a get a nose job. They wanted and 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 she refused. She also, when they told her your name, it's too long. You got to change it. So what did she do? She dropped the A out of Barbara. Mm -hmm. So so it's that kind of thing that that was going on. It was it was Hollywood saying we need to make movies with people who looked like average people. Mm -hmm. And guess what we're seeing again? What movies are succeeding right now? It's movies with people who look are like, looking average. As well, they look to, average, but a lot of them have that <clears throat> thing, that charisma, yeah. that star quality. Like when you watch Hell in High Water with uh, Jeff Bridges, Chris Pine, and Ben Foster, the one that I had my eyes on for most of it, although Chris Pine has those big blue eyes and he's a wonderful actor, is Ben Foster, who looks like a young Gene Hackman. Yep. And these are not handsome men. They're not unattractive. The thing that, that they have that thing where you can't take your eyes off them and their energy and their talent make them bigger bigger than life. And that when they're speaking, they're all you're, you're looking at. I made a list of um, the f some of the films I've watched recently, Hell in High Water, and, and they are financing really terrific f scripts and films. Uh, Manchester by the Sea, Room, La La Land, Get Out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hidden Figures. Yep. Uh, the, oh, the Accountant, Love and Love and Mercy, about Brian Wilson, right? Uh, Gone Girl. What they're doing also, which they've always done, is they're going to publishing, they're going to, to books mm -hmm. and literary, and mm -hmm. they're going literary. And for better or worse, they're making like The Girl on the Train, which was a dreadful uh, adaptation of a very good book, and um, a film like Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Which garnered Academy Award nominations. A black, I think it was a black and white film. I can't remember. And um, crazy, I was then crazy, stupid love, which made me fall deeply in love with Ryan Gosling. So and I think there's a good reason for, um, as far as the, what well, what you would say, kind of plain Jane, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, I would attribute that to the internet. Mm. I would attribute that to the internet and what we see in terms of YouTube creators, because when you Absolutely. see these people. They're, they're not, average people. They're not. They're, they're, they're not. They're they're not some like big Hollywood, you know, made up publicity person. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's just, you know, it's me. It's an average person, and they're put up on on screen, and they do very well. Really. Uh. So I. So I. I think that's part of. And 
that reflection in, in that. Yeah. Where this is also similar to the 60s is that there's a roughness. On yeah. The yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. Roughness yeah. Oh, where, where when, when you look at something, whether it be MSNBC or CNN or Fox, and you see the, the anchor babes, and you see how they are, both male and female, mm -hmm. and, and you see how they are, and then you see someone like Bill O'Reilly when he's doing his, his, his vlog, and you're going, mm -hmm. got it. He was never that good. So much of his camera charisma was enhanced tremendously right. mm -hmm. by the fact that he had proper studio lighting, proper makeup, mm -hmm. and, and where you didn't see this doddering old man talking. And there's also, um, you, Dan and I saw a student film last week that was very well acted and that was very gratifying for us. And the lead was not handsome. He wasn't unattractive. He had a wonderful face. He had a nice face. Mm -hmm. He had a film face. He had a film, but he had that him. something that the camera loved him. Plus mm -hmm. he was very talented. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to project that thing. So I maintain it isn't just that someone looks average. They've got something that's way above average when mm -hmm. the camera is turned mm -hmm. on. And that has been going on for a hundred years, over a hundred years now. Who does the camera love? That's a whole other episode. We, mm -hmm. we talk about who does the camera love and it's not always who you think it will love. And it doesn't have anything to do with perfect features or model looks. Mm -hmm. It has to do with that thing, that ineffable thing that is projected by an actor. Yeah. And I think that what happened with it's so interesting, Bonnie and Clyde was played by these two very beautiful people, and yet you had Gene Hackman playing his brother and that little guy. Michael J. Pollard. M M Michael J. Pollard and Estelle. Um, Estelle Getty. I'm not, uh, no, uh, Estelle uh, Parsons. Parsons and Academy Award nominations and all over Gene the place. Hackman. And, and, and Gene Wilder's and in Gene it. And Gene Wilder's in that. So while you had these two really gorgeous kind of iconic leads, and I think it was really important to cast those two people, and, and yet all the supporting actors were at, very talented and, and not so great looking. Well, I, I want to ask this uh, to Mike. Have you seen Please. Bonnie and Clyde? Yeah, oh, the original film, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'd love to know what you think of it because I, Saran and I saw it in real time. Right. And I'd love to know what, I, I, I'd love to know <laughs> yeah. what, what, what you thought of it I, seeing it when it was already way, Legacy. Well, well after Legacy, yeah. I, I liked it, I enjoyed it. I think it's a great film. Uh, it's great performances. The the funny thing is when you when you mention that like legacy the my my introduction and I think I said this before that my introduction to Warren Beatty was Dick Tracy that was the first time I'd say and that was already well after you know Bonnie and Clyde yeah. and you know whatever By that um, time was already a dirty old man hanging out hanging with Madonna. out with Madonna yeah that's that's <laughs> that was my introduction so it's a little it was a little you know different but uh, going back and seeing seeing him as a younger man um, it, I liked it I liked the film I think it was great and and I enjoyed it um, I didn't. I think of how to put this. It's not that it's legacy, but it's it's at least at this point, I feel like it holds up well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To this to, to I'm, now. I'm interested in you saying that because I went and saw a screening of it uh, down at USC, mm -hmm. and the audience hated it. And, how, and, what was it? Okay, what was the, the average age oh, of the audience? Oh, the, it, it was younger. Was it was all film students. Okay. And and the reason they hated it. It was something that was transparent to me, but was very, very indicative of when it was made. Because in, really? 19, in 1967, you still had the Hollywood system in place. Right. So you still had this idea that your stars had to look great. Mm -hmm. So you have okay. this movie with very, very uh, camera realistic images of, of, the, of the 1930s, the Dust Bowl right. area. And with but all that's these great, people, that just adds to the aesthetic. No, that was the great part. But in the middle of this, you have Warren Beatty showing up wearing a beautifully tailored outfit. You have yeah. Faye Dunaway wearing these, these clothes. These berets that were, and those very, tops. Yeah, that were, very crisp, yes, that were meant yeah. to look very, yeah. sh very, very Chic. kind of period, but they kind of weren't. But at the same time, they were obviously well tailored clothes. Right. So she, so she didn't fit. And so for them, the movie was almost dystopian. That they're watching it where it's like pleasant, though, where there's there, where 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 they're in a, a, an alien environment. Well, I'll go back to my point earlier, which uh -huh. is the, you, if if you're talking mm -hmm. a bunch of USC students today, so a bunch of 17, 18, 19, yeah. 20 year old kids. That's what they're now growing up in, in the YouTube verse where, like you said, the average person and they're used to seeing a certain aesthetic. So it's very, f I, I would imagine, yeah, I would see if, if I grew up only seeing that and then going back and then watching a film like this, where, they, which, is, yes, which is the opposite. They're of having difficulty so, suspending so, dis yeah, disbelief. Yes, so I get that. Absolutely. But so one I of the things that. that also, it's the, it's the ADR. 
The other thing that drove them crazy is they thought the movie felt like it was dubbed in English because so much of it was shot on location. It was shot with the cheaper, uh, the lighter cameras that were available right. at that time. And it was okay. all post sync. A lot of it was post sync sound. Mm. So, so there's that hollowness to post sync sound yeah. that it's that we don't really have that they here. could not sync themselves. They watched so critically yeah. that they couldn't sink into the, into the story <clears throat> and, and the relationships. I think also what Bonnie and Clyde did was introduced the use of music in a very profound way as part of a soundtrack, mm -hmm. and just as The Graduate uh, did with Simon and Garfunkel. The banjo music. And the banjo music. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 it brought music in as part of the, a part of the story. Mm -hmm. And so that was something very new. And also something that my former boss, I worked for a producer at Fox, and as his development person, he used to talk about when we come in on a Monday and talk about the movies we saw over the weekend, and he would say it had such great energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things Bonnie and Clyde had was this very particular American can-do, uh, rising above, you know, facing mm -hmm. obstacles even mm -hmm. though they were criminals, this incredible, incredible energy. So there would be, like, for instance, when they're in that house, all of them, if you remember, they've got somebody delivering food and mm -hmm. they've got the cars in the driveway and it's a period of peace. They're singing or they're playing a game or whatever they're doing and all of a sudden they realize that the cops are coming. It's like baseball. Nothing happens, ev then everything happens. Right. Nothing happens, um, and I don't mean nothing. And so this incredible pace that, that the, and it, it was able to take its time like when she goes to the picnic and sees her mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it had this incredible pace and incredible energy that's very particularly American. It was like these filmmakers were, were finding something in our roots rather than this kind of, this plastic veneer of these films that you mentioned before of Hello, Dolly, and Star, and Darling Lily, and all of that, that there was something very rough and and pioneer-like about these films, even the, oh. even the graduate. Well, also <laughs> in terms of its timing, here we were in the middle of the Vietnam War, you, you had a lot of protests going on, and here was a movie that because the production code had sunset, now all of a sudden the people who'd always been the bad guys were the good guys. Now all of a sudden the sheriff is the villain. And, and mm -hmm. it, 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 when, when, in, in the early in the '60s, and I first saw it when it had its network TV premiere on ABC on Sunday night, uh, uh, and my parents were shocked. But but when it was uh, when at, at that era, it was a clarion call for for the youth. And now yes. we're so used to seeing antiheroes, whether it be uh, right. uh, Breaking Bad and all that, right. that it's it's not a surprise anymore. So I'm I'm really I also I'm think really that's why that Captain America did so well because it's a flip on that. Yeah, he's not the antihero. Which he, film he is that? Is, that's uh, Captain America. Uh huh. Out of out of all the Marvel films, that's probably the one that's done the, the best in terms of uh, not only in terms of audience like liking the person mm -hmm. or liking the character, mm -hmm. but um, in terms of financial as well. May, I think it's that, and maybe Iron Man probably did a little bit better. But but people really gravitate towards those films. And it was also the rise of, of those, these young directors mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. we talked about who were. Oh, although think about who the director Bonnie and Clyde was. Arthur Pan, yeah. who directed it, the Miracle Worker. It, but but here you had a studio director. It's just like when you when you go and look at The Graduate. Everyone c talked about how look at how wonderful this movie is. Look at how it captures the youthful vigor. Look at how this great the cinematographer was. Yeah. The was cinematographer it? was seventy. Well, here's oh the thing about Bonnie and Clyde was he, Arthur Penn was the director, but who was the producer? Warren Beatty. Yeah. And we all know mm. that Warren Beatty, when he produced or was in a film, he was one of the boss. He was the boss ultimately. I, I'll tell you what was great about Warren Beatty too, and this is what I find lacking in Hollywood. It was very annoying to me when I was in film school that it was very auteurist oriented. Yeah. Now I wish we'd get that back. Yeah. Warren Beatty was a true auteur because even though he didn't direct it, even though because he didn't trust himself as a director at that point, what he did is he listened. Yes. And when I want to say it was Dee Dee Allen, when Dee Dee Allen was editing it. And she said, this thing is not working. It is coming out very bad. And Warren listened. listened. And, and that's why you have the banjo interludes. That's why you have the interstitials where people say, well, I know I'm bringing them a mess of flowers to their funeral. Mm -hmm. That all of that was added so that it added a context to it. The banjo music, that, it, it, it changed the movie. And, and, and what I'm seeing lacking today is instead of having uh, the, the auteurist mindset, with the exception of the Tarantinos and, and certain mm -hmm. people like that, you have a corporatist mindset yeah. where, where you, you don't see, 
you, you don't see, even someone who's had as many hits as someone like Michael Bay, who I know is a particularly a, 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 a weak point for people, but we, I don't see him even being at the level of Irwin Allen when he was doing Poseidon Adventure or Towering Inferno in terms of actually having a unique vision. When yeah. I look at yeah. Transformers, it might as well be a TV movie right. yeah. that was directed yes. by Paul Bogart. Yeah. You know, it's Absolutely. it's that it's it's that all in the family like. Yes, yeah. putting your stamp putting your, putting your stamp on. And that's I think that's also why these other films that I mentioned earlier, the the Don't Breathe Get Out, because they don't they they fit a very specific vision. They're right. very niche, but they're also a little rough. If you watch it, it's not perfect. Yes. It's not one hundred percent color corrected to the point where you're like, wait, what? So some of the shots are a little out of frame. Mm -hmm. Some of the line, so, but that's it. That makes it beautiful. Because and, you, and, and that. also, you know, you see that you see the artist. Stroke. It's not some. It's and not some Xerox because, thing. Because 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 you're in. invested in the story and, and, and you want to know what happens well, next. What happens fantastic. next? I mean, that's no, that's the writing. most important thing. And that's great writing. But it, it's all those little yes, things too absolutely. that that films like a franchise film, like a Marvel film. Mm -hmm. Do not have. They don't no. If you have an imperfection in that, forget it. You really. So what's what's the um, so what's the <clears> answer? Because fifty fifty years ago was fifty years ago. A different time. A different mm -hmm. business. What is the what is the answer? I think everything for me is so diffuse. There is no one answer. Mm -hmm. One of the it's, things is this is to stop relying on remakes of things oh, that have been already God, been remade. Please. And we just we had a discussion about and this the and and the <laughs> oh franchises. There's nothing wrong with a uh, franchise, but as you all know, in my world, Godfather Three does not exist mm. because it ended. For a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, the end of mm -hmm. Godfather Two. That was the end of the story. Mm -hmm. My thing is, is um, Coppola must have needed the money. That's my theory. Um, so what is what what to do about all this when you have such a corp? You didn't have. You've always had a corporate mentality, but right. you had people who loved the movies, right? right. The, the difference is the attitude toward the audience. Mm, yeah. In every uh, yep. previous period, and I, 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 I'm sounding just like my, my, my father and mother talking about, oh, and yeah. but, but, <laughs> but, 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 when I was, but yeah. what had to but go uphill what yeah. both ways <laughs> going, walk, Walking five miles to school both ways uphill in the snow <laughs> in Hawaii. <laughs> but but it, it was, but, but one of the things was that there was a respect for the audience. Mm -hmm. And I have never seen Hollywood be contemptuous of its audience the way it is now, where, yeah, totally agree. where yeah, there's this absolutely. sense that, that the audience is so stupid that, that all it needs is the right publicity campaign. Yeah. Right. All a movie needs is the right amount of propaganda yeah. around it. And yep. then the propaganda is done wrong. By the way, it, they, they, they are right in the big picture that if you propagandize the film properly, you can at least have an opening weekend. Yeah. Most yeah. of the time, unless it's everyone piece, just knows. And, and I just want to... I don't, I don't even want to say I, I beg to differ, but I like to go back to the nine or 12 or 47 w movies, whatever, that were nominated for Oscars last year. Mm -hmm. And think about them. Each film was a quality <clears throat> film. Hidden Figures, Moonlight, right. yep. La La Land. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't think of any others. They weren't mainstream Hollywood. They weren't well, mainstream. Well, ma yeah, they the, were the best movies always came out of the, the fringes of Hollywood right. rather than the mainstream. Right. But the mainstream would incorporate it. What I'm seeing missing is that instead of saying, wow, Hidden Figures did really well, right. what other African-American positive spinning um, uh, melodrama can we make that, that will tap into that audience? Because that audience crossed over big time right. into the Caucasian audience. Mm -hmm. so, so obviously that meant there was a lack in the Caucasian audience. Mm -hmm. And instead, what are we seeing Hollywood do as its Afrocentric films? It's it's the girls' night out type pictures, yeah. which yeah. is fine, yeah, because those make money and they're, and, and they're, I hear and it's great. funny. I hear it's yeah. but but yeah. it's also 122 minutes. How did that happen? I don't know. But yeah. but oh, but when wow. you're Long. two hours, yes, two hours really? and two minutes. Oh, but wow. but how is it that that instead of looking at hidden figures and saying, wow, this is this is a niche that we can fill, uh, we we also have all of these these spaces where we can have the fun stuff. But but there there's a definite way that we can that that we can again flash back to the 70s which was the same era mm -hmm. where the black exploitation pictures yep. came in and dictated to old school hollywood what was going to come next yeah. trust me dirty harry owes yes lot. i was just oh, going to say yeah. i was just oh, going to say God, that yes. absolutely Everything. absolutely Everything. well they oh, i think loving which um which was an interesting it, it, it was an interesting small film it lacked something but it was so well done and you were so invested and and in these people and also it transcends race because 
this white uh, this white man marries a, a black woman. She's got Indian and, bl and black uh, blood. And um, they grew up the, in, in this part of uh, South Carolina, I believe it was, where everybody grew up with everybody. Mm -hmm. That there was no big deal. And they couldn't believe that they, in a Virginia, it was Virginia, that they would be arrested because it was against the law. And when it finally went to the Supreme Court with two Jewish lawyers, which is so interesting, um, he says, that one of the lawyers says to him, is there anything I, you want me to tell the judges? Because he didn't want to attend. He said, just tell them I love my wife. That's very powerful, and it's true. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. So there are films to be made with pe persons of color mm -hmm. that are can be hard-edged and mm -hmm. inspiring, mm -hmm. like Hidden Figures, where, we mm -hmm. don't, where nobody's a saint, but people are just trying to achieve and live the best life right. possible, and Moonlighting, which had gay, gay black protagonists, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, and for me, as you know, it all comes down to the script, because there are so many good actors out there. You've got a pool of brilliant actors and great directors. Mm -hmm. your, your writer's pool is much smaller. Mm -hmm. And to be able to write a film that inspires and entertains and l leaves you with that satisfied feeling like after a good meal, that's Hollywood's challenge, whether it's a big $100 million film yeah. or, or a $20 million film. It's all in the story. T mm -hmm. tell, me, tell me a really good story. I'd like to leave the last word with Michael. Please. So tell us what your idea, because you're the future. Yes. We're the past. Oh, oh you're God. the future. So, We're so you. <laughs> We're done. We're so no, over. No pressure. You no tell pressure. us no where <laughs> you feel you can fill a gap. Oh, for me specifically, that's you easy. You specifically. Yeah, me, yes. that, no, me specific, uh, specifically, that's it. And we've talked about this a lot. It's horror. For me, horror. Horror and or, to some degree, sci-fi, but mo mostly horror. And I think someone like... A Fetty Alvarez, I think, maybe kind of in the same sort of thing, uh, but I'll just a little different because I, for me, I do uh, my my heroes, of course, are, you know, I've told uh -huh. you this before, someone like a Joss Whedon, you know, things like that, and then mixing that in with what Fetty Alvarez uh, Alvarez is doing today, and with a kind of exploitation edge to it in in, in that genre. Um, why though? Why? Well, why oh, because I grew did, up on that. But but why, but oh, you think you think that's the future? For me, for me, I don't. I can't. Okay, speak so for that's everyone. what you like. But do you but, think but that? In I think for for the future for for Hollywood, I, again, I think it is in the same vein, kind of what what we what we were talking about. Where move away from the franchise, move away from the right. platform, stuff with a little harder edge, and and like you were saying, with with real people looking or or the actors looking more more mm -hmm. like an ordinary or real mm -hmm. people with a great story. Now, whatever that story is, honestly, it doesn't matter. It could be a flying glass no-brainer, right. or it could be the greatest art film on the planet, right. but the writing has to be there. Absolutely, and I, I, was thinking, I was thinking about Deadpool because uh, our, exactly, our, pro our perfect, producer could perfect. not believe I hadn't seen that it, and he recommended to me, and I finally saw it, and I the found... The anti-superhero movie. Perfect. The thing that makes that movie is his dialogue. Perfect. Because perfect. I didn't understand there was all this you know all those physical and, scenes and they got to be it, too much and if you what? watch it it's not it the aesthetically as well yeah. it's it's gritty it's dark it's, it's, it's yeah it, it's his character and his dialogue and his attitude that's and his and and his relationship with his girlfriend mm -hmm. that absolutely saves this film because totally. without it it would just oh, be no, another it, one of yeah. those superheroes fighting superheroes and do I care Any, anybody else but Ryan Reynolds could not have done that yes he no, was no. just wonderful just but, wonderful but as a final word, Please. what are you going to do? You, Michael Gonzalez, oh, not Lord. big picture. Oh. What, yeah, are what are you, you? doing? Oh, Lord. Uh, I've been debating that for a minute. Um, I think at the moment I'm going to follow the track that I'm on, which is, I, 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 I can say this because I'm, I'm on the vlog. It doesn't matter. Um, being on the Philip DeFranco show and still writing for them. And there's, there's already plans for us to do stuff specifically for us, like doing debate shows and, and things. So, so I'll, I'll most likely be featured more and more on the show. Um, so follow that and then find a way to backward engineer that into a great film career. Okay, if we gave you $50 million to make a film, what would you make? Oh, Quick. Easy. It would, either, it would be one of two movies. It would either be my vampire detective movie mm -hmm. or it would be the, the film that I'm finishing up writing now, which is the uh, five kids get stuck in this house uh, horror-esque film, but in the in the style of a Jello. Oh, okay. You're yeah. gonna have to explain to the audience what a Jello. So I'm sorry if you it's don't Italian know. Horror, I'm sorry if right. you don't know what that is. And it's an Italian yeah. horror film that's right. very very geared towards aesthetics and very geared towards great death scenes. Just oh. phenomenal, over the top death that's scenes, awesome. great that's aesthetics, awesome. and I unfortunately. <laughs> 
Italian giallos don't tend to have the best story behind them. Right. I would actually put a story, story with them. Actually, a story. That would and, be the and difference. Here's, and you're speaking about this reminds me, and perhaps all of us, that <clears> it's <throat> a big pool out there. There mm -hmm. are so many different genres. There are so many different audiences and crossover audiences. People like me, I like a good chick flick. I like a suspense thing. And if, and if it's a well-written horror film like mm -hmm. Get Out, mm -hmm. I will watch it. Yep. So what we can say to everyone is go write your script, yep. go make your movie, go to the movies, watch great TV, and come back and visit Dan and Saran. And one and Dan last and thing, Saran. One th last thing. I completely agree with Dan. Do not have contempt for your audience. Don't have contempt. Respect, respect your audience. Respect your audience. Always that respect be, your audience. That's the number one thing. And that's all we have for this episode. I'm Saran Fox. Dan Watanabe. Please like and subscribe. Yes, and Wherever our, our guest's is. vlog. Uh, and uh, we are Dan and Saran Take on Hollywood, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.